Good morning, everyone. I am thrilled to be back with another live stream. It has been a little bit and thrilled to be joined with Doximity CEO Jeff Tagney. Good morning. Good morning, Deidre. Congratulations. We just saw you ring the opening bell. It is a big milestone. <laughs> Why don't we start really simple? Tell our viewers uh, what you guys are, what makes you the LinkedIn for doctors. Oh, well, thanks, you. Obviously, exciting day, huge milestone for us. Um, here at Doximity, we build software that helps doctors be more productive to help them provide the best care for their patients. So today we have over 80% of all U.S. physicians as active members on our platform. And you're right, we began as this LinkedIn for doctors where we've really grown now into a productivity suite. So we do over 30 million digital interactions a day, helping doctors do telehealth video calls with their patients or collaborating with their colleagues or doing e-signatures, workflows, staying up in the latest uh, news, tra treatments and therapies. Um, so we've really become the digital platform for many doctors in the U.S. And I tweeted out just before this live stream that you guys aren't the average unicorn. I'm used to covering unicorns that burn through a lot of money, that raise a lot of money. You guys haven't actually raised money since 2014. You're profitable. Uh, tell us how you got there, how you have this model, how you've been able to sort of go so long without raising money, too. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, that's yeah. Last we raised was in 2014, seven years ago. So if I seem a little out of practice, it's because we haven't talked to uh, investors that much. We've been cash flow positive the last four years. You know, really, I just credit it to uh, the focus and dedication of our team and really keeping that focus on just helping physicians be more productive. It's it's really a little sad, honestly, how how hard it's been to get software in helping doctors provide better care. Uh, you know, we joke, you know, software is indeed eating the world, but it kind of choked a little bit on healthcare, <laughs> And that's because <laughs> patient privacy laws called HIPAA that make it illegal for doctors to send an email about a patient to another doctor. So we're really proud to be helping them uh, digitize and collaborate digitally. But how did you get such scale without raising money as well? And I know that you don't spend a ton on marketing. So how did you get the word out? How did you get so many, as you say, not just physicians, but medical and pharmaceutical companies on the platform? I mean, we have a super experienced team. And again, they've just done a terrific job. Um, you know, for many of us, this is our second time doing this. So there's another company we took public in 2010 that was in a similar space. So that certainly helped our capital efficiency, as you say. Um, but really, again, it comes back to uh, healthcare's issues are so, uh, so difficult that having spent so many years in the space that just we found some, I think, really low hanging fruit to help doctors be more productive. Right. And is there sort of like a viral aspect to this then? Because you guys did get so many doctors onto the platform. Did you rely on word of mouth? Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I mean, early on and still today, I mean, 80 percent of our doctors who join and again, we're over 80 percent of all U.S. physicians as active members. Um, they they learn about it from other doctors uh, because they like the fact that we help them with their prior auth e-signature flow and cc their electronic health record and we're you know built for them in lots of little subtle ways but ways that help them again provide better care for their patients and where did the idea come from i know i love what you just said software is eating the world but it hiccuped a little bit when it came <laughs> to help yeah, yeah. and uh, full disclaimer i'm canadian and i only got to know the american system about five years ago and it's still I'm not saying one is better than the other, but it still makes my head spin. Just yeah, even yeah. the idea of finding a doctor. And I feel like there's been some really positive changes over the last year throughout the pandemic, seeing more of it digitized. But you created this long before the pandemic. So where did you see the need and the opportunity? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so a couple of things. First, I'll say that our CTO and a lot of our engineering team from Canada, it's the only place we actually do on-campus uh, interviewing right now, is uh, going up to Waterloo and McGill. Uh, so we have a fondness for Canadians, and we joke that uh, we we had to bring them in to help solve U.S. healthcare problems. <laughs> Which is ironic, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's ironic. Um, I will say it is a very complicated system, and the security laws and everything else, again, they're with, with good basis. I mean, sending your lab report via email is the privacy equivalent of sending a postcard, right? Because any server along the way can read it. And so you really have to teach the Internet to whisper and the Internet is it's a tool built for shouting in a lot of cases. So we really had to go through and verify the identity of every member uh, using their their NPI number. It's called social security number. Uh, and that's a, a difficult, you know, decade long effort, which is 
how long you've been at this, a decade. Um, but once you start to put that together and create those secure nodes, again, you really create something that's that's powerful that la lets doctors do uh, do their jobs more efficiently. What kind of challenges did you face along the way, um, especially as you try to digitize something that has been so reluctant to go that way um, to make it to this point, your IPO? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there have been a lot of challenges. You know, honestly, we the network effects, I think, don't really kick in until you get to a certain scale. So I'd say those first four or five years getting these very busy physicians who, frankly, have tried lots of software that doesn't work. So, you know, I think are are appropriately skeptical of you know new things offering to make their their days more efficient. Um, I think those first four or five years, it was difficult. But once we started hitting tipping points in individual hospitals where we got you know over half of doctors in a hospital using us, then it really started to take off and it really uh, has had a momentum of its own since. Who do you see as your biggest competitor going forward? Big tech is looking more and more to push into the healthcare space, but they face their own obstacles. And also you have sort of the institutionalized space using more digital tools. So who do you think you're competing with? Yeah. Probably the, the closest product offering to what we have is, believe it or not, a Japanese company called M3 that runs a physician network in Japan. And uh, they've been doing it for a few more years than we have. So we've seen you know, bits of their their product and, and learned a bit from it. Um, you know, here in the United States, there really isn't anything that's that's um, immediately comparable to us. Of course, there's LinkedIn, uh, which has a smaller percentage of physicians than us and doesn't have the HIPAA security and the ability to look up by subspecialty and you know, really do clinical consults or curbsides, they call them. Um, but uh, yeah, beyond that, uh, there's not a whole lot of direct competitors that I'd call out. Do you think about big tech? Do they keep you up at night? Amazon's move into the healthcare space, the vast amounts of data that they already have. Microsoft, as you mentioned, with LinkedIn, if they decided to go further into the space, do you worry about that? No, not a lot. Uh, you know, to be honest, our mantra as a company is physicians first. We do these weekend summits with physicians. We learn how to make, you know, again, their lives more efficient. And, you know, there's only a million physicians or so in the United States. So for big tech, it doesn't seem like a, you know, a, a big target or an area where they, I think, invested to understand it. Um, they do do a lot on the consumer side. And of course, you know, Amazon and everyone else now is standing up their own consumer facing telehealth. But again, our approach is to digitize the doctor's practices. And so we really don't compete with them uh, directly. That's a great point. Where are you guys five, 10 years from now? Are you looking at going into the consumer side as you grow? No, I mean, we're we're steadfastly focused on, again, these very busy million people who really, again, take care of the sick all day and, and aren't given great tools to mm -hmm. um, to collaborate with each other easily and to, again, make care better. So uh, you know, part of our uh, success really has been our focus and we're going to keep that focused. And that, that is such a key, important mission. And, you know, the focus, I think a lot of people would find value in that. But I wonder, does it limit your market opportunity? Can't help but note there's another company going public today around the same size as you guys in terms of revenue, getting nearly double the valuation. Um, what like I guess what drives you? Perhaps not that valuation in the short term, certainly in the long term. But I do wonder how do you now as a public company CEO pitch your story to public market investors who, for better or worse, want to see those growth numbers, want to see that bigger TAM? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And certainly we've been on the roadshow the last couple of weeks. And so we've been asked, you know, the total addressable market question. <laughs> quite a lot. Um, I'll say this. The thing I'm most excited about with this IPO and, and change in ownership is that we're able to share our success with over 10,000 physician members who uh, bought into our reserve shares program. So our largest new shareholder in this IPO is physicians in the U.S. And we're, again, proud to serve them and proud to be uh, so physician owned. Uh, in terms of addressable markets, I'll just say, you know, healthcare is big. It's 18% of this economy and doctors direct 13% of the total economy every day, deciding drug A or drug B, surgeon A or surgeon B. And so again, we think that there's a, a lot of headroom again for us to be a very meaningful company, again, focusing on physical needs. You just brought up one of the most interesting things that I found about the IPO, and that is up to 15% allocation of the IPO offering to physicians on your network. Uh, did you, where did, first tell me, where did that idea come from? I covered the Uber and Airbnb IPOs. Of course, they gave some allotment to 
Uber their drivers and Airbnb their hosts, but not as much as you are, 15%. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, it really comes from these uh, physician summits. And of course, we have a lot of physicians on our team. And, you know, physicians are sort of outsiders in the financial markets and business world. And yet, you know, in our life and world, they're the insiders, they're the people we care about most. So um, having uh, physician shareholders is uh, just natural for us. Uh, we've, we've always had a lot of advisors. We do give out a lot of uh, shares to them over time. And I've just found that um, it really aligns our interests well. So, so it was the company's idea, but again, the physician response and um, uh, you know, willingness to pull out their own checkbooks to help us out here, we, we really appreciate it. I love how you say help us out, whereas I think many people in financial markets would say you're helping them out because there's been a big debate raging about the IPO pop and institutional event investors perhaps getting an advantage by getting in earlier, the general public, but you're sort of giving your physicians that opportunity, which is really interesting. By the way, my doctor actually listens to CNBC on the way into the office in the morning, so I have to make sure I send him, send him this interview. Uh, was it your idea though to do this and were you inspired by what uber and airbnb did yes and yes and again you know all is equal as we started to do this road show and, and meet with folks we just realized that you know the best value-added investors for us are those advisors that we've had hundreds of doctors who uh take the time to uh, give us feedback so we just want more of that and you know we'd rather the shares go to them if there's a pop than to you know some some hedge fund somewhere and this is so fascinating. My producer just sent me this tidbit, but your career as an entrepreneur started actually in a Stanford dorm room and your roommates were physicians. Is that right? Are you still in close touch with them? Are they advising you on? Oh, these texting moves? them at 2 a.m. this morning. Yeah, no, it, it's they're they're great, my best friends. And again, the yeah, being a physician in this country today is a very difficult job. In this past year, uh, the selflessness, it's it's really been our honor to serve them. Absolutely. And we've talked to, we've spoken to a lot of people just the last year has been amazing between this business and medical world convergence and each understanding the other side to put us in the pretty remarkable position that we are in right now. Um, last question for you. Why did you decide on the traditional IPO route? Um, you kind of talked about giving some allocation to physicians, which I'm sure was an important part of it. Did you consider a direct listing or going public by a SPAC? Yeah. Uh, so actually, I'll, I'll pick up on a point you made earlier here first. You know, this notion of bringing engineers and doctors together, that's really the secret to our, our success at the end of the day. You know, we joke we're, we're teaching uh, Ruby to folks who speak Latin and Latin to folks who speak Ruby, right? I mean, it, and it, it's two different worlds. And bringing those circles together has been really the magic of the company. We, we joke internally, we're docs and dorks as a company. <laughs> and <laughs> docs and dorks together, that's when you really do come up with I think solutions that really help patients. So we're, we're proud of that. Um, we didn't look that seriously at SPACs. Uh, you know, we recognize that we were a bit under the radar and that we needed the, uh, the broader um, sort of awareness that an IPO process can bring. Um, so we looked at it briefly. I have to say that I, I encourage direct listings uh, and SPACs a lot because it's improved the economics for us. <laughs> the banks are charging <laughs> less and doing more, which is good. Um, so I, I like that. It idea. improved the economics on the traditional IPO side. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good. What are you going to use the proceeds for? Well, uh, we raised 50 million from T. Rowe Price and Morgan Stanley back in 2014. We ended up never touching it because our business ended up being faster growing than we expected at the time. But, you know, our investors joked that it was sort of mattress money for me and the team. It helped us sleep better at night and continue to lean in uh, like we were able to do during this pandemic. Our team, uh, really lean in. We had hired a bunch of folks uh, helping out doctors with their telehealth visits and integrating into their electronic health records. And we set up a whole new team and we did 63 million telehealth visits last year on our platform. And so that just ability to be opportunistic as a product like company is, is what I think the extra capital gets us. Right. So as you put it, it's, it's money under the mattress. Is that how you would put it? I mean, we look at the current interest rates. Yes. <laughs> uh, but, um, <laughs> No, I mean, again, I'll just say we'll be thoughtful about it and it's certainly not going to burn a hole in our product. Then, product then pocket. why not a direct listing? You could have saved even more money on fees. Uh, I've had this debate uh, with a few notable folks who really understand it. I think the IPO process, again, provided us a marketing benefit with a, a more traditional approach. I mean, we're not Spotify. We're not, not something that millions and millions of retail investors use. So. 
Um, I don't know. We may have ended up paying an extra couple percentage points in fees going the IPO route, but it just felt the the better way to bring this under the radar company out to the markets. Fair enough. Will you be upset if you see a huge IPO pop? Will you see that as money that could have gone towards the business? On behalf of our physician members, absolutely not. No, I, I think uh, if if folks are excited and and pleased to invest in the company and you know take us to the, the next step of our journey here, uh, especially with so many doctors participating along the way in that kind of pop, then I think great. Um, you know, obviously we don't want to be inefficient, uh, and again, we've tried to be prudent in the process, uh, but. Uh, I mean, I will say the, the, the level of interest from the traditional Wall Street names uh, has been, well, pleasing for us. <laughs> you, you're so modest, Jeff, as, as you say that. Um, I'm, I'm sure it was. And really, really, we look forward to see what you do now as a public company. Please stay in touch with us. And on a personal note, my dad was a lawyer in the medical practice for a long time. Being a Canadian, moving to America, it's, it's just such a, and obviously, of course, over the last year, what we've seen the industry do and the technology. Um, it's been fascinating to talk to you and I could spend another half hour at least, at least continuing to ask you, cover you with questions. Um, so come back soon on the actual programming or another live stream and good luck today. Congratulations. Will do. Thanks, Deirdre. Great question. Okay.